Hey, Dave Ferry here. Welcome to this edition of the Trackside Modeler. This is episode three in our little series about how to build an HON30 display or module. The techniques I'm using apply to any scale and gauge. You can use them in HO, N, O gauge, ON30, depending on, on, on what your preference is. I'm using these techniques in HON30 because I have a lot of HON30 equipment and I'm fascinated by the sugarcane trains that ran in Cuba. So uh, this little model will have some tropical scenery and will use all the funky little HON30 engines and cars that were uh, available back 10, 20 years ago in the United States and Europe. In this episode, I'm going to do some of the things I didn't have time to do in the last segment. I'm going to work on the roads and show you how I build roads. And then we're going to work on the stream. We're going to put in a retaining wall. And then we're going to kind of finish the waterway so that it looks like water. In the last episode, we just finished painting our rocks. And here's a little recap. I'm using four colors on the rock castings, white, black, raw umber, and raw sienna. After everything dries, I'm going to go in and just touch up the tips of the rocks with a little more white. That's what I'm doing here. I'm just applying white just to the outermost surfaces of the rocks. These are rocks along a waterfront, but the same techniques apply to our little diorama. Now we're going to start the roads. And for the roads on this little project, I'm going to use just thin cardboard. Now you can use styrene, you could use gator board, you could use foam core, masonite, uh, anything you want, as long as it's easily workable. What I'm going to do with this cardboard right now is I'm going to give it a good coat on both sides with spray matte varnish, like the Krylon product, just to seal it a little bit, because the scenery methods we're going to use are called water-soluble scenery. It means the cardboard is going to be soaked in water at some point in its life here. I want to make sure that the cardboard doesn't absorb a lot of water. So here I am at the spray booth and I'm soaking both sides of the cardboard strips with the Krylon matte spray. You could use any other kind. of You could use spray paint or anything you want, but make sure you do this in a safe environment. You don't want to be breathing the fumes. After the cardboard has dried a couple of days, it's time to lay out this curvy road. And as you can see here, I'm just taking a straight edge and I'm cutting the pieces and every place the road curves, I'm making a separate section out of the cardboard. One of my favorite all-time modeling tools, believe it or not, is the paper cutter. I use this for everything and it comes in especially handy when I'm cutting the little pieces for the road. And when we're done cutting, I'm going to lay them out so that you can see how I've positioned them. And I've numbered them so that I can recreate the road if I have to take the pieces out. The next step, after all the little road pieces are in place, is to start at the track and work back towards the middle of the display to the middle of the road. What I want to do first is fit the pieces that are snug against the track, make sure they fit perfectly, and then work backwards. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start right here on this end because there are two little pieces that go in here between the tracks and I'm going to make sure they fit perfectly and then I'll go back and finish the rest of the road. So now it's time to glue the pieces in place. I pull back the blue tape here and test fit everything again. I know where everything's going to go and I know that it fits pretty well. So now it's time to take the liquid nails and take my putty knife and spread some liquid nails on the back of each piece and push it into place. Now because the edges of the cardboard butt up against the track, I'm pushing them down a little bit and squishing the cardboard. I'm running my fingernails across the area where the cardboard meets the track just to push it down a little. What I really want is the cardboard to be about a sixty-fourth of an inch below the track level. That way when we clean the track we're not going to destroy any of the scenery. On the other side of the display I'm doing the same thing 
putting some liquid nails directly on the cardboard, then I'm going to spread it around with the putty knife and push the piece into place. By the way, that's red paint on my finger and not blood. And I didn't notice it until after I shot this scene, but, you know, everybody that builds models gets paint on their fingers. So, every piece gets glued down, it gets put into place, a weight gets put on top of it, and then we leave it for several hours so that the liquid nails can set. Uh, you can also use silicone caulking for this. You can use uh, any kind of other kinds of caulking as long as they don't affect the styrofoam. Here's the next to last piece being installed. Right beside this part of the road I'm going to install a retaining wall which I've already built and that's the next topic we'll cover. Here's the little retaining wall being installed and all it is is a piece of styrofoam. In fact it's a piece of a styrofoam bridge and what I've done I've just glued a plaster brick casting to the rear of it and it's going to fit right in here beside the road and it'll look like a blocked up culvert. So what I'm doing now is cleaning up the foam chips and getting rid of all the pieces and then we use a trusty liquid nails on this piece and it's going to be pushed into place then a weight will be laid on it to make sure that uh, it'll stay there until the liquid nails sets. While I'm working in this area I want to add the extension to the scenery divide that I put on the other side of the little river and for that I'm using this pre-cast piece of foam rock. This is a piece of rock that you can get from Scenic Express. It's part of a larger piece and what I did I took a hacksaw and cut out this piece when it's painted and had a little more sculptor mold added around the base of it it'll look just like the rock on the other end of the railroad. So here I'm finishing up the roads a little bit. I'm putting on a first coat of lightweight spackle. This is the same stuff that you'd use to patch a hole in a piece of drywall and I like the lightweight spackle because first of all it's lightweight, it dries pretty fast and it's not messy to use. So this is the first coat to fill the road joints. I'll sand these and add another coat as we go. After I sanded the seams in the road, I added a fillet of lightweight spackle on either side of the road so that it would blend into the surrounding scenery. I'll finish up by painting the roads in earth color. While I'm waiting for the second coat of paint on the roads to dry, I'm going to ballast the track. And to do that, I'm going to use finely sifted contractor sand. What I do, I buy the contractor sand in a 40-pound bag, and I sift a lot of it through a tea strainer. This is a tea strainer. This one's been around the world, and it's old as the hills. And what I do, I save the finest grit that comes out of the tea strainer and use it for ballast. And to spread the ballast, I'm going to use this piece of foam rubber. This is the same type of rubber that comes when you purchase a model steam engine or diesel engine. It comes packed in this, and all I did was cut a piece to use as a ballast spreader. Here you can see it fits nicely between the rails, and it pushes all the ballast down to be even with the tops of the ties. And to do the edges, all you have to do is rest the piece of foam rubber on the rail and just smooth it out on an angle. I'm going to continue to spread the ballast around our little railroad here. And you have to pay particular attention around the turnouts. One of the things I don't do, and I make this a point, is to not put any ballast near the points of the turnout. And here I'm working around the turnout and keeping all of the grit and all the extra ballast away from the points. I don't want glue or water or ballast or anything to foul the points because I want them to work. The glue I'm going to use to hold the ballast in place is matte medium. This is from Scenic Express, and Scenic Express says to dilute this with four parts water. I have it diluted here with three parts water because I'm going to put water as a wetting agent into the ballast, which is what I'm doing now. The water's a little bit cloudy because I had some matte medium 
in the syringe already. This is wet water, water into which a couple of drops of dishwashing detergent have been added. And after the wet water spreads out and wets down all the ballast, I go in with the diluted matte medium, three to one, three parts water, one part matte medium, and let it spread over the ballast and be absorbed and sucked under the, under the rail and between the ties. I want really good coverage with this, so I put a lot on. And after the matte medium has been absorbed by the ballast, I go in with a paper towel and I absorb any excess that has leaked out on the sides, as you can see here. So this cleanup is not really important. You can leave it, but all it does is extend the drying time, and I want this to dry. You should go away and leave it overnight. Now we build the roads, and for the dirt roads, I'm going to use a finer tea strainer. This is just a, another kind of tea strainer with a finer mesh screen in the bottom of it. And I'm going to use this to sift out the finest pieces of contractor sand that I can get. But first, I'm going to cover the road with another layer of earth colored paint. This is the first layer of texture for the road. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to sprinkle the grit right into the wet paint. So I've put some grit into the tea strainer, and now I'm just tapping it with my fingers. I've actually put a little too much in this tea strainer, but I'm going to dump some of it out. And I'm going to keep tapping until I cover all of the wet paint area. And you can see it's putting on a nice fine layer of grit and most of this will stick into the wet paint and what doesn't stick I'll vacuum away and I'll sp sprinkle on a little bit more and apply some glue over it and I'll demonstrate this as we go. Now I'm making a little texture in the road surface and this is just a piece of strip wood and I'm just dragging it through the sand just to make ruts and wheel marks and such. So we're going to keep going and finish the roads up on the whole project and when I get everything done, then we'll go away and let it dry overnight and then add some more texture in step two. I've kind of changed gears here for step two. I'm using a finer grit. I rummaged around and I found some uh, sand that was very, very fine. You can see it here. It goes on like face powder. So I'm making this part of the road with this fine powder. The last step after the paint dries is to go in with another layer of paint and seal up the road surface, which is what I'm doing here. Now I'm sealing it with paint. You might say, well, it looks good the way it is. Why are you sealing it with paint? Well, I want to add some detail to the road. I want to add some detail with paint and I want to seal it first so that the paint won't sink into the texture that's on the road. At the very end of this project, I'll also color these roads with a little bit of pastel chalk. And having this coat of paint on there will allow me to spread the chalk more evenly. Now it's time to put down the ground cover, and I favor a three-layer approach. I'm going to put white glue down everywhere I want the ground cover to stick. And then I'm going to continue adding texture over the ground cover. And when I'm all done, I'm going to mist it with wet water and then spray on a little bit of matte medium. That way I've made a sandwich. I have the white glue, I have the texture, and then I have more glue, which is the matte medium, on top. And it holds every, everything in place. And you can keep working. You can start and finish an area uh, the same day at the same time. And when you're all done, everything will be stuck together very nicely. The basic ground cover is a blend of materials. Here you can see there are greens and browns and several different colors and textures. And this is a good way to use up excess bits and pieces of scenic foam. And the beauty of the blend is that it fools your eye into thinking there's more texture there than there really is. So I've taken white glue, just regular Elmer's glue all, and I've diluted it half with water. 
I want to be able to spread this out very easily and I don't care if it puddles or if it pulls back from the scenic base a little bit it doesn't make any difference at this point all I want to do is get good coverage a good layer of glue and then I'm going to sprinkle my foam into it. The secondary texture that I'm going to use on this display is Scenic Express Flock and Turf. This is a mixture of scenic foam and flocking. It also has coarse and fine pieces in it. So it gives you an added dimension and a little different color. And I'm using it here any place where water would collect, like along the side of the road, at the base of the rocks, and any place I want a little extra green color. I'm going to clean up as I go and I'm doing this with just a soft bristle brush and all I'm doing I'm just removing the green foam from areas where I don't want it. Now I really don't care if I get some in the track because after the glue dries in this initial application I'm going to go back and run a vacuum cleaner just along the track just to pick up any of the green foam that's on the ballast between the rails. So I'm going to continue on here. I'm adding the dilute glue, sprinkling the green foam in it, and I'm going to continue to do this on the rest of the railroad. Now, this is just, as I said before, this is just the first application of texture. After I vacuum between the rails, I'm going to go in and work on each area individually to add detail. The first big area of detail that I plan on adding are the sugarcane fields. And I'm going to make the sugarcane using the same technique that tree makers use to make pine trees. So it'll be interesting and hopefully I'll have enough time at the end of this video to show you how I'm going to do it. This is a repetitive part of scenery building but as soon as we have all of the base ground cover down then we can go and do the creative part of it which is detailing every area. Now I'm picking up with a paper towel the excess glue that's flowed into the river but I find out that maybe I should have left it there because I went back and applied more glue so that I could add a little of the sand, the same material that we use for ballast. I'm adding it back here to the river banks to the base of the river in any place that would get washed out if there was a heavy rain. I also tossed a little under the bridge and it'll be held in place when we flow on the mat medium. Just before I went to bed I soaked the area of the riverbed down with the loop mat medium. Now it's the next day and everything is dry and before I actually paint the riverbed I want to make it nice and wet. And the reason I'm doing this is I want the paint I put in here to flow into all the nooks and crannies. The first layer of paint I'm going to use is black acrylic paint. This is cheap school grade acrylics. You get this in a craft store, not a hobby shop. I use a lot of craft store acrylics, especially the inexpensive school grade acrylics. This is not fine art. This is just building scenery, so we don't need to pay extra for really good paint quality. This paint will last the life of the model railroad without fading, so there's no worries about using inexpensive acrylics here. And you can see I'm using my trusty china bristle brush, and I'm just daubing the black into the water that we squirted on here. I neglected to mention that the wet water is made by just adding three or four drops of liquid dish detergent into 16 ounces of tap water. I put it in a spray bottle so that I can just squirt it onto the scenery. Now I'm using a real small brush to get the black under the bridge. Now it's time to add a little bit of blue to the black waterway and for this I'm using cerulean blue. This is the color I use for all my water building projects because I think it best looks like the sky reflecting back into the water. I'm going to use both the small and the large brushes to just add blue to the black and what I want to do is bring the level of black up to a light dark blue. And you can see me doing this here. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep adding blue until I get a color that I like. And I don't know how to describe this to you other than saying that if you get a color that looks like a baby blue and it's quite dark 
it's probably going to work okay. The last color I'm going to use here because I want this to look somewhat like slow moving muddy water like you see in places in the tropics is to take a little of our earth colored paint on the small brush and I want to brush it along the edges. What I'm trying to duplicate here are rocks and shallow spots under the water. So to make it a little bit lighter works really well. And you can see I add the earth, but as soon as I brush it around a bit, there's enough black to blend it in and tone it down quite a bit. The last step is to randomly blend the colors together. And I do that by taking a spray bottle with our wet water in it and just spraying it on the water surface. The water allows the colors to blend together in a random manner. This is what it looks like on the other side of the bridge. And I'm going to show you this again from start to finish here because it's a really handy technique to know about. Spraying water back into the scene to allow the colors to blend really gives the look of water because the colors kind of swirl around together and mix in a very, very random manner. So the next step is to go away, allow this to dry, and then I'll add some more detail along the riverbank. I decided to try to speed up the drying process a little bit, and here I'm using a hot air gun to try and dry up some of the water. Now you have to be really careful with this hot air gun because the styrofoam is underneath and you can melt it. I'm going to add rocks gravel and then greenery along the riverbank here and I'm going to use the three layer approach that I talked about before where I put down thick glue on the bottom add my details and textures into the glue and then spread more glue on top this creates a sandwich as I explained before with glue on the bottom glue on the top and the texture in between so along the riverbanks here what I'm doing is putting down full strength white glue. I'm squeezing it right out of the bottle, right into the area where I want to hold the larger and heavier textures in place. Then I'm taking some gravel, the same stuff that I use to ballast the track and put on the roads. I'm taking some of that and I'm adding it on top of the heavier stones. And what this does, it fills in all of the gaps that you can see and kind of gives the the rock surface a lived-in look. It makes it look like I didn't just dump it there. It makes it look like nature put it there. And then over this, I put a large sprinkling of scenic foam. This is the blended texture, and I add that over the gravel to kind of complete the blending process, and it kind of holds everything together. Now I'm going to continue down the stream banks here on both sides of our little river and add the white glue, the, the heavy texture, the, the gravel, and then the scenic foam texture. And I see I didn't clean these rocks too well and there's little sticks and twigs in them. But what I want, I want everything out of the river bottom and up near the banks. So what I'm going to do after I get all of the texture in place I'm going to go back with a soft brush and I'm going to brush all of the texture that spilled over into the waterway. I'm going to brush it back into the banks of the river. When everything is in place and the riverbed is clean, free from debris, then I'm going to soak this whole area down with dilute matte medium. This is matte medium diluted with three parts water, one part matte medium. It's put in a spray bottle and you just spray it on. Now I'm going to go away and let it dry overnight. Before I leave you this month, I want to give you a short introduction on how I'm planning to build my sugarcane fields. What I'm going to do is take a wire twisting tool and some sisal rope, which I have here in my hand. I'm going to glue it to the wire. I'm going to take a wire twisting tool and I'm going to twist them and I'm going to make some tall weeds which have a wire armature as a base. This is the same principle you'd use if you were building bottle brush pine trees. 
So what I'm doing, I'm spreading out the pieces of the rope fiber. I've cut off small sections, I've untwisted the rope, and now I'm, with my fingers, spreading out sections into a thin cross-section here, and I'm laying them into the glue. The more fibers you use, the better off you are. You'll have a thicker feel. So I'm going to continue separating and placing the fibers on the wire. This is not a fussy job, and you can use all of the pieces that you have left over. Now to twist the wires together, I'm going to use this Micromark Safety Wire Twister. This is a pair of locking pliers that has a screw mechanism on the end, and when you pull it, it causes the pliers to spin, thereby twisting the wires together. So now, after all of the fibers are in place, I'm going to put a top wire over the bottom wire, and then remove the tape, and put this whole sandwich, two wires with the fiber in the middle, in the vise that I have on the front of the workbench. So now I'm putting one end in the vise. I want to hold this end securely so the two wires stay together. And on the other end, I've clamped on the Micromark wire twister. And you can see you just pull the handle and it twists it. And you pull it as many times as you think you need to. Okay, I've pulled the tool now six or eight times and the wire is twisted enough to hold the fibers in place. So the next step here is to take it out of the tool take it out of the vise, put it up on the workbench, and trim the ends. Making tall grass this way was not my idea. It was developed by a group of fellows in Florida who are building a G-gauge railroad called the Sundance Central. You may have seen it at some of the model railroad conventions. What they did, they twisted the, the fiber in the wire, and then they bent all of the fibers upward, as you can see here. What they were looking for was something a little different than a bottle brush tree. Here's a tree here that I've trimmed up a little bit. But they wanted something that looked different than this. They wanted all the fibers sticking upward. So here's my little sample weed. All the fibers are upward. I'm going to take a pair of scissors. I'm going to trim it. And then I'm going to take it to the paint booth. And I'm going to paint it with this Design Master basil color to represent tall sugarcane. 